Well, brethren, continuing in our consideration of the God of abundance, today we're going to talk about abundant mercy and a lively hope. Again, it's 1 Peter 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. Now, firstly, we want to see that these things are according to His abundant mercy. Now, we see in this this morning how much it really took to save us. What, what a grand task this really was to undertake. Surely this wasn't simple or easy. This was a, a, a profound thing. Uh, there's a lot to be seen in this demonstration of the mercy on, on the part of God. We'll see in this actually the nature of His mercy, how, how, it, how He acts in this. Now in the world, mercy, it can be defined and, and sometimes as the discretionary power of a judge or of someone in position of authority to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment. However, mercy in the sense of our text, it can't really be described in this manner. See, our pardon was not as a judge who decided to forego punishment in favor of mercy on the part of the one who was guilty. It's a little bit different than that. Yes. I, I think too many in our time think of salvation in this way. Uh, really, the, the way that they perceive it when it's brought to its logical conclusion, it doesn't require Jesus to have died at all. Yeah. Really. If God was able to just forget about your sin, if He was able to just ex decide to do that, to accept you, then Christ is dead in vain. I mean, if that's really the case. The whole idea is, it's so prevalent in our day, and an enemy has done this. He has entered this into the thought. See, sin, it causes a dullness to arise in, in you that it actually makes you blind to the debt that sin had created. That there is a very real debt. That it's, it's as if there, a chasm has been opened between the person and God. That there's, there's no getting to God unless that chasm is bridged, unless there's something done about this problem. It's not just going to go away. It's just, it's, it's not that it shouldn't, it's just not possible for God to do this. In salvation, God wasn't so merciful that He did not require the satisfaction of justice. So He didn't just choose to forget. The debt was too great and His very nature could not deny the execution of His wrath against mankind. It, it could not. This is in our society, it's kind of a hard thing to understand, isn't it? And nobody really knows what real debt is. You go in debt and here, well, you can just declare bankruptcy and seven years later, it's all forgiven, right? No, this is, this is debt that's not going to go away. It has to be paid. Amen. Now, uh, God is abundant in goodness and in truth. And this is the reason why he can't, just, he can't just forgive this. See, he is of pure eyes than to behold evil. And he can't, he can't look on iniquity. That is to say, he can't abide it when he sees it. If he really looks upon it and sees it, something has to be done about it. Uh, see, several times throughout Scripture, there's instances in which God is said to have looked upon a person or you know, upon a circumstance, whether for, for weal or woe, whenever he really fixes his gaze upon that, something, something is done. Mm -hmm. And we know it, it says this right before the flood happened. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for flesh had corrupted his way upon earth. And the very next sentence, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. The, this, he, this is just in God's nature. A, a, a judgment goes forth. Uh, there, there's many times throughout the scriptures where these judgments take place. So when the iniquity is so great that it just moves God to do something about it. Yeah, even though we know of these monumental occasions of the wrath of God and this demonstration of, of this part of His person, uh, we also see that um, it peppered in the record occasions where the Lord provided things that were actually like a way to help the people to, to cause to remember him, His Son. They were like aids to His own long-suffering, you know? All, all the things that happened in the law and the services that were ordained, everything about those services were, as it were, like a divine reminder to Himself to, to, to not be wrathful against the people and not destroy them, but to remember that there's going to be, there's coming a time when this is going to be brought to its conclusion. This problem is going to be taken care of. 
Um, he was actually for he's been forbearing uh, all the way up until the time of Christ and not completely destroying mankind. He could have at any time done this and would have been right in doing so. It, it, but he's he's forbearing them in in light of what is going to happen. And those of us who are in Christ, we can actually all um, personally testify of this fact that we have partaken of this mercy of God in our own lives. There was a space and time in which God forbore, he forbore us until the time of our regeneration. Whenever we, we look upon this and we can see it, we, we can see how much he really had to bear in bringing us to that point. Whenever we see that, we see the greatness of this mercy of God that how many times we frustrated, the, we frustrated Him and how many times we were wicked and did things that were hor horrid in His sight, but He was merciful. He was merciful and He forbore us until the time of our regeneration. Whenever you see that and you really see that He led you to repentance, now that's, that has power to it. It really does and inciting godliness. So then when we go about to examine His mercy, it, it's not seen in that He spared punishment, but that He spared us from the punishment. The punishment was exacted. Uh, his mercy towards us in this way, it's really only realized by us after the, the aftermath of the sentence, so to speak. See, He made a way for His righteousness to be satisfied and His mercy to be demonstrated. See, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace, they have kissed each other. So this morning, as it concerns the text at hand, see, we see the mercy of our God as this, it's like the umbrella, it's the environment, so to speak, in which He begat us again by the resurrection of Christ, according to this greatness and this abundance of His mercy. So this is how he. This is you know the the environment in which he has begotten us again. Now I thank God that he didn't show mercy to us in the way that it's spoken of in our day. That that mercy really isn't even mercy at all. In doing what he has done, God did not forget who we were. He doesn't forget that we're born of Adam and that that in our nature we're sinful and we're flesh. And this is actually involved in Jesus redeeming us from all iniquity. See, it's not only the iniquity of itself. It's not only the sins, but it's the things that have been tainted by sin. See, so great is the righteousness of our God that, that though the sentence has been passed upon sin and that the price has been paid for it, the punishment has been leveled against the thoughts and actions of humanity and rebelling against God. There's more to be done to finally purge the effects of sin. See, this isn't the entirety of what's been corrupted by the entrance of sin into the world. See, our bodies themselves were defiled. His very image which was in us was made corrupted. And the earth itself which God created is cursed and under a death sentence. So God keeps all of these things in mind in redemption. He doesn't just forgive us. He gives us a new body. He gives us a new man. He puts a new spirit within us. He gives us to be a partaker of the divine nature. And He he affords us this change in environment. So we're, we're, we're actually saved from multiple things. And so we can see the wisdom of God in the way that He has accomplished this. And now that He no longer sees our sin, and now that they've been cast as far as the east is from the west, He can do these things. He's free to, to regenerate man into the image of Christ. So he, He's... he's uh, begotten us again unto this lively hope. And this is a lively hope. The words of the apostle here in their nature, it, it points us forward to the things that are to come. That is like the essence of hope. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. See that hope is pointing us forward. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is the hope of glory looking forward. See, this, this is the hope that makes not ashamed. This hope. Now, this is the hope of eternal life. This is the hope of righteousness. This is the hope in which every man who has it purifies himself, even as he is pure. So this, this is the, the one hope of our calling. This is the hope of God, the hope that is in Christ Jesus. We are made heirs according to this hope. 
This hope is substan- substantive. It has weight to it. It has matter to it. it, it this, it's, it's like an anchor of the soul. See, it directs our paths, and it's what we live according to. We, we live in this stance of joyful expectation to see the fulfillment of these things. And this, this, is the, this is the promise of God to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are made heirs according to this hope. And uh, the, we, we are confident that one day we will finally and gloriously be liberated from this body in the present evil world in which we reside. Now, this is the reason why actually we are able to endure. Although for, for a time we're subject to manifold temptations. And, and that is why if we are last in this world, we can, we can just humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Because we know in due time He'll exalt us and, and we'll be first. Uh, this is actually the hope by which Paul was able to say, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? But I, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, that's the hope talking right there. But remember, see, we're talking about a lively hope. It, it's not only that we'll be liberated from this body and from this place of death, but as the apostle put it, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be clothed upon. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. See, whenever I think about this, I think what we've said before in our assembly about that we're groaning, not moaning. That's, yeah. In this tabernacle, we do groan, but uh, we can say with Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, we can echo along with the words of Christ and say, how long shall I suffer you? But it, it's, this is in an anticipation. It's not in complaining. So if you're complaining, really, you've forgotten the reason for your sojourn. Uh, there's a sense of discontentment in the present. We can all testify of this, but that's because we're waiting to be clothed upon from our house, which is from heaven. See, we're, we're, we're anticipating something better. We're not just looking forward to being no longer in the earth. See, we're, we're getting ready for that glory that will be revealed in us. Amen. We're getting ready for the things that really can only be done by those who possess a glorified body such as this. Uh, as I was going through this, I, I listed here a few examples of these. These are things that really they can only be done in their full capacity by those who have this glorious body. Uh, some of these things are, are things that we experience in measure in the present, but all of them have not been full, experienced in their fullness. Amen. But ye are a chosen generation. See, in the present, it's not evident to everyone who the children of God are, but in that day, there's going to be no mistaking them. In fact, your enemies, He's going to make them bow before you and say, God is in you of a truth. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Now, we may have done our service to God to the degree that we were able to in this time, but imagine, brethren, the service we're going to be doing then. See, we, we may have had our practice in reigning and, and reigning over our mortal bodies and buffeting our bodies and giving them to the Lord and, and passing our ta- time here and sojourning in fear. You, we have this practice of keeping under our bodies. Well, imagine how much He's going to be able to trust us with in that time. He's going to be able to entrust us kingdoms to be able to reign with. And we'll be ready to reign and to serve then. So we're a holy nation and a peculiar people. How true is that going to be of the church? What other race of beings can be compared to the church of God in Christ Jesus? None. As a word, you're going to be able to be a work done that has never, never been even thought of. And that you should show forth the praises of Him who have called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. You know, when I, when I l- heard this phrase this last week, I, it, it dawned on me, that's why we can't learn that new song that we're going to learn then. Because we haven't seen all of the marvelous light. We've only seen the amount of it that we can see now. So we, we can sing about what we can see, but then we're going to see a whole lot more. So we're going to have a whole lot more songs to be sung then. Amen. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, we've, we've experienced this in the present that uh, in our regeneration, in being um, 
forgiven of our sins, we're able to see the grace of God in that. But we're actually able to see more of the grace of God in our transformation into the image of Christ Jesus. It's from glory to glory, this increasing stage of glory. So imagine in the world to come how much glory He's going to be able to unfold in using these people that He has from glory to glory transformed into the image of His Son. So to the intent now and to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now if surely if the wisdom of God in making this race of men was displayed in its majesty for these powers to see and they desire to look into these things, imagine how much desire they want to have to look into those things that are going to happen. Good things, brethren. Now this is abundance. This is the nature of our God. This is what we've been talking about. It's just increasing, increasing stage of glory. As we continue to look upon these things and anticipate their fulfillment, it, our apprehensions of these things to come, they just become larger and more abundant. It just, it, there's, no, there's no end to the increase. So then, this has been done by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, as the Apostle continues, he brings to our attention the means by which we were begat by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now, this is a striking statement, and it's actually one that puts to shame the a body of Christian teaching in our generation, in which the resurrection really isn't something that's focused on a lot. In fact, the only time you really hear about the resurrection is on Easter, and even then, it's, it's just what happened. It's just the events themselves and not the implications of what happened. That, that, that the, 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 the resurrection of Christ is actually the reason why we live now. We, we are saved by His life. Yeah. His resurrection life, not His life on earth. It says here that uh, uh, Paul was asking for them that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. See, He demonstrated this when He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand. In that action. Now this kind of language is not symbolic. It's not. <laughs> And it may sound like foolishness to the world, but the truth is that when we're born into Christ Jesus, we become partakers of His actual resurrection life. That's the truth. Uh, due to higher criticism and some other things in, in the world today, it's kind of, it's really, well, you're one of those people who takes Scripture literally. Well, yeah, what, what else are we going to do with it? Yes, I take it literally. I, uh, but being buried with Him into baptism when we're raised from the water, we are raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. We are. Not, not that we should have a new kind of life. It's not a lifestyle. Uh -huh. it, it, oh, it's a, Christianity is a way of life. It's not a way of life. It is the life. It is Amen. the way of life. There is no other way of life. Yeah. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. Now, this has been a source of concern for me ever since I've, I've been renewed in the spirit of my mind and been uh, experientially been made accepted in the Beloved. How this truth can be lost from the minds of so many people who are professing Christ. It's just mind-boggling. That salvation, it really doesn't leave us to ourselves to, to maintain a holy stance after we've been forgiven. It's not that we just had to slate wipe clean and now you're you're on your own. You just try to do better, but you know, you won't we all, you know, have our faults and God understands too. Really? I don't think so. Uh, oh, and, uh, this one, all your past, present and future sins are paid for. So therefore, do whatever you want to, right? No. What does Paul say? Paul says I know I have it in my mind, and it's... I'm sorry. Uh, he, yeah, see, he, he anticipated this trend. He knew what people were going to do this. You know, uh, uh, how shall we sin? Uh, shall we sin that grace may abound? I don't know why it took me so long to get that out. God forbid! Amen. See, he anticipated what the flesh was going to do with this. He knew. 
This is what, exactly what's happening in our day. It's right there. The truth is that we are given a powerful new nature when we're born into Christ. It has power. If you give yourself to it in the fear of the Lord, it will change your affections. That's what they're not. That's what they don't tell people. It's not by discipline. The most disciplined person in the world can live a outwardly sinless life. The Pharisees did that. Now, it'll actually make you not want to do anything that's like Jesus. That's, that's what this nature does. And as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of something. It's, I've known this for a while, but it's like one of them gems I had to uh, t- take a look at again, and I wanted to dust it off before I presented it to you, brethren, because I don't want to present some dusty gems today. So um, I was reminded that the, the realization of this truth, that, that Christ in you, the hope of glory, that he really does change you. Uh, you are made a partaker of the divine nature, and you're transformed into the image of Christ. It, it really can only be apprehended to the degree that you know who Jesus is and what Jesus is like. To the degree that you are able to see Jesus, you can be transformed into his image. Uh, With this in mind, it really makes sense that in the day in which we live in where there's multiple Jesuses being preached, that it's hard to appeal to people on the basis of who Christ is. This is, he's muddied the waters, has complicated the issue. Uh, people preach more about what Jesus wants for you and what Jesus wants to do for you and how you, 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 you. People just don't talk this way. If you, if you went up and asked the average Christian, uh, what can you tell me about the nature of Christ and how are you being transformed into his image? They probably wouldn't have any idea what you were talking about. Other than maybe, well, uh, we, we just stop whenever we say something and ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Okay, well, that's open to individual interpretation, isn't it? How much do you really know, Christ? That's what your answer would be in that. The question is, what did Jesus do? And who is Jesus? And what's Jesus doing now? And where is Jesus going? And are you following Him? And, and what, what do you have to give up to be able to continue to follow Him? What, what is it lies between your path and His? That's the question we should be asking. And, well, you know, we have this uh, other thing. They say, well, the Christian life is repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Well, really, I thought it was repentance and faith and glory to glory and faith to faith. That's what the Christian life is. This continually upward plateau to a higher and higher state of glory. Being transformed into the image of Christ as we behold His face. So then, uh, within the context of our text, we're begotten again unto this lively hope by the resurrection of Christ. Yet again. All things in eternity that awaits us are they're really contingent upon this reality that we have been joined to Christ. This is like a, a springboard of apostolic expo- exposition. This is like something that, that's a rock-solid foundation from which we can start. Uh, he reasons upon this regularly, Paul and uh, the other brethren in the epistles, whether it be for matters of practical living in the present, he tells them in Corinthians, "...know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ?" This is the point in which we can reason from. If that's true, then shall I take the members of Christ and make them a members of an harlot? See, it doesn't make any sense when you look at it from that light. God forbid. And know ye not that your bodies... Oh, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. See, this is, this is something that we can reckon on. This is something that's hard and solid that we can reason from. But reckon yourself to be alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he appeals to this truth in another place, and he reasons that it only makes sense to seek those things that are above because that's where Christ is. If you're joined to Christ, then that's where you should be looking to. If you, if you be then risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That just makes sense if you think about it. And set your affection on things above and not on the earth. For you're dead. If you're dead to it, then why would you pay attention to it? And your life is hid with Christ in God. That's how much that unity is real. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Even more so than these, it's so thorough is this unity that we've been given with in Christ that in, in addition to in the present being made the very righteousness of God in Him and, and being made set in these heavenly places where Christ is, is now and been made dead to the world in sin, in the, in the ages to come, we're going to reign with Christ. 
So we, we don't have as many explicit details as, as we would like in the present, but we do know, we do know some things. It says in, in Revelation, these are promises that Jesus has gave to the church. These are, are really drawing to me when I read them. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of potter. They shall be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my Father. So even as Jesus re has received, you're going to receive a part of that. That's, that's how much you have been joined to Christ. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and then sat down with my father in his throne. And in Daniel, he uh, kind of expands upon this. He talks about, And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. I, I've always been really, really drawn to this truth that there, there's going to be a time when e you may even be called to judge your enemies. This is something that in a, in a time of trial can be a comfort to you to know that... Well, we have an, an example here in our midst is that Brother Robert is being persecuted by these individuals in the present. And uh, it could come a day when God says, all right, brother, uh, um, Judge um, Robert presiding, uh, bring these people before him. Did you know that when you uh, made it harder for him to be able to walk in the present, that you oppressed him, that you are actually oppressing me? And that he's a worker together with me, so I'm going to appoint him as a, as a judge over you. <laughs> so just think about that whenever you have a trial. It, it'll help you to be able to have peace in that trial, to know that even if you don't get justice here, you don't have to seek after it haughtily, but that you can, you can look forward to the fact that God is going to make it right then. And lastly, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now that is the commendation that you want. I don't care about the commendation of men. That is the commendation that I am seeking. Go well done, good and faithful servant. Now, in conclusion to these things, I exhort you, brethren, to look for the mercies of God. These, these mercies are new every morning. This is the truth. He has actually graciously crafted this highway of holiness, and it leads to that city whose builder and maker is God. That's the design of it. That's where it's going. You stay on that narrow path, and that's where you're headed. As long as you keep looking unto Jesus, it's like a built-in protection of it. You won't be tempted to stray. Because these things really are more satisfying. These things really are more abundant than what anything, anyone else has to offer. He, the Lord has shed forth these things abundantly. It only remains that you take part in it, that you receive it. Keep eating of this table that's set before you in the wilderness in anticipation. To, it's actually a grace, too. He gives you food on the way. He gives you a feast in the wilderness. And one day you'll partake of that wedding feast that's yet to come. Thank you.